Good afternoon. I would like to thank very much the European Association of Urology, the European School of Urology, the EAU Guideline Office for giving to ESAO the opportunity to organize this uh, webinar. And it is an honor for me to have in this panel, Professor Andrea Salonia, who is the Dean of the Studies in the International MD program. He is Professor of Urology also. He is co-director in the International PhD course in Clinical and Experimental Medicine in University Vita Salute, San Rafael, Milano, Italy. And also, it is a great honor to have in this panel, Professor Alexander Giverman. He is professor in reproductive medicine at Lund University in Sweden, and he is a senior consultant in andrology at Scania University Hospital. Together with us is an expert in urological surgery and andrology research. He is Professor Minhas. And Professor Minhas is also consultant andrologist in Imperial College in London. I would like to ask very kindly Professor Salonia to give us his thoughts on the sperm DNA fragmentation assay and its role in the therapeutic management of male infertility. Andrea, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Sofikitis. It is a great honor for me to, to be here with you today and try and quite briefly summarize a number of content dealing with uh, this very odd topic, if I may, which is uh, quite important since uh, it is very controversial and uh, you know compelling at the same time. So I'm trying to start my talk dealing with the concept that according to our EAU guidelines, uh, and uh, I'm more than proud to be along with uh, Zach Minas, uh, the chairman and the co-chairman of the uh, you know, uh, EAU guidelines on sexual reproductive health, I want to uh, consider, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. I'm going to consider that according to our recommendation, it is a strong recommendation with very uh, rating strength, which is strong, to consider at the very same time, both partners of each couple presenting for infertility. This is compulsory, but it is very important to say that usually speaking, uh, this does not happen that frequently. At the same time, what is uh, important for me is that uh, we have a sort of uh, diagnostic workup that uh, means uh, that we should perform a semen analysis, which is the so-called baseline evaluation modality for each single patient coming to the office and seeking medical help for infertility purposes. In this context, uh, considering that having a normal semen analysis should be quitting and stopping any further uh, consideration and infertile analysis in men attending uh, an infertility clinic, uh, it is probably wrong. This is the reason for us uh, to perform this study last year, where we compare a cohort of patients who came in because of infertility and a cohort of, uh, in, uh, of fertile uh, volunteers uh, with a normal fertility profile, according to the WHO. And uh, if you may see to the red squares, uh, there was a certain amount of fertile men with normal sperm parameters, according to the WHO per se, which means roughly 41%, as compared to 12% uh, of infertile person. But that means that at least roughly, I would say at least 60% of fertile men did report at least one semen abnormality. This is really relevant since uh, probably we cannot consider that uh, our semen analysis uh, is enough. It is something like a descriptive evaluation. And that was uh, be the case for us to decide to add this sentence uh, 
across the uh, you know, EAU guidelines chapter dealing with sexual and reproductive health. Even more important to me, there is an increased amount of data suggesting that DNA uh, fragmentation index uh, should be considered in the everyday clinical practice since uh, the accumulation of both single and uh, double strand breaks could be associated with a reduced uh, you know, chance of uh, natural conception. But at the same time, data are able to say that it is certainly much more common in infertile men who actually had bad outcomes at uh, ART who actually, in couples, who actually had poor uh, pregnancy rates because of recurrent, uh, uh, you know, miscarriages. And uh, even more important now, there is something dealing with the concept of uh, the healthy profile of our offspring. And therefore, if you get a look to very, this very, very comprehensive uh, uh, systematic review, which has been performed by uh, Agarwar and his own uh, group uh, recently published. There are many reasons for us to consider because they are potential causative, uh, you know, uh, correlations with uh, having higher value of DFI. That's including the most popular varicocele. One more, systematic inflammation and general infections. And why don't outline the concept of uh, you know, aging. Therefore, there are many reasons for us to be considered before considering that a simple semen analysis should be the outcome for us as a normal parameter in the everyday clinical practice. How to produce a DNA fragmentation analysis? There are at least four different methodologies the tunnel, the comet, the SCD test, and the SCASA test, which is probably the most uh, you know, widely and diffused test. Unfortunately, what has been uh, clear to now is that the threshold for normality is not that commonly and diffused. Therefore, we cannot consider that there is one single threshold of normality, although most of the data which has been meta-analyzed very recently demonstrated that probably having a value which is higher than 20% may be associated with bad outcomes and therefore a, a value which is uh, above 20% can predict infertility status. It is important to say that uh, once again today, we do not have standardized cutoff and this is the reason for us to consider a number of cons and pros uh, dealing with uh, this kind of uh, you know, parameter. Even more important, if you try to understand where it could be you know, most useful to use uh, and to apply this kind of assessment, the first, I would say, uh, situation for me is the so-called unexplained infertility. What does it mean? It does mean that we do have normal semen parameters but still uh, infertility. In this context, it has been demonstrated that probably there is, uh, or there could be a higher value of DNA fragmentation. First situation, unexplained infertility. And there is an increased amount of patients coming to the office and seeking medical help because of infertility, which is an unexplained one. Second situation, recurrent pregnancy uh, loss in you know, natural conception. Data seems to suggest that uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the higher the number of DNA fragmentation, the lower the probability of natural conception. And this is the case in uh, uh, couples who are looking for uh, you know, uh, 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 fertility purposes. Uh, without any kind of uh, ART approach, and even after ART. Therefore, three different situations, unexplained infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss uh, in uh, natural conception, or after or during ART, three different situations. Even more important, DFI and pregnancy outcomes. The pregnancy rate has been demonstrated to be lower according to higher values of uh, DFI. Therefore, the lower the better. And this is the case even for life birth rate. And uh, if you get a look to the date of our uh, publication, they are close to 
2021, most of them. Therefore, they are very, very recently published. And therefore, if you try to find even the cons situation, which means uh, there is no association at all. Well, we do have at least one paper which has been recently published. They were not able to find any kind of correlation between uh, the value of the FI and the pregnancy rate. Therefore, once again, controversy in this setting. Even more important, the FI to choose between IVF and ICSI. Is that that simple? Probably it is not that simple at all. This paper, which has been published two years ago, it is really relevant to me. If you try to understand the concept of how to choose to apply IVF versus ICSI in a couple who is coming to the office because of male factor infertility. Well, they demonstrated that the higher the number of EFI, the better to choose ICSI versus IVF. Therefore, the modality to approach ART in this type of couple should be considering even BFI fragmentation and, of course, its value. Is that the case every time? This is not probably the case any time. Indeed, this very important meta-analysis, which has been recently published by the group of Albert Salas Huetos, they were able to demonstrate that if you try to combine the uh, data of uh, IVF and ICSI, you may find some results. But at the same time, whenever you are going to uh, subdivide data dealing with the concept of IVF versus ICSI, the outcomes are completely different. And indeed, there was no association with. And therefore, DFI per se is not that able to uh, dichotomize and to uh, you know, support your choice for IVF versus uh, ICSI. Why? Well, first of all, data seems to be not considering the female factor, and therefore that is a major flaw of these studies as a wall. And the second issue, there is so high heterogeneity among uh, methodologies uh, for uh, you know, assessing the FI that unfortunately the outcomes of uh, such a kind of, uh, I would say, rigorous meta-analysis uh, are that uh, uh, you know, unbiased. Therefore, according to the literature, we do have uh, that uh, using uh, any kind of, uh, of modality to assess the DFI could be useful uh, in predicting uh, ART outcomes, although data are conflicting, but uh, it is reasonable to consider that probably SDF, uh, therefore DFI uh, ratio, is relevant in the context of ART. Finally, we have data enough to say that DFI per se is even important in terms of offspring health. And the number of data uh, concerning this specific topic is increasing throughout the last 10 years, roughly. If you get a look to the uh, recommendation, this is our EAU recommendations. We put as a strong recommendation to perform DNA fragmentation tests in the assessment of couples with recurrent pregnancy loss from natural conception and ART, or in men with unexplained infertility, three different situations. AUA are uh, you know, associated with uh, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and they produce very important guidelines. These assess should not be routinely performed in the initial evaluation of the infertile men. Is that different? I don't think so. It is a moderate recommendation, but it is not controversial. It is not con the EAU association uh, you know, uh, recommendation, which is strong, conversely speaking. ASHRAE, in couples with recurrent pregnancy loss, can be considered for explanatory purposes. Once again, it is suggestible in this kind of uh, situation. The European Academy of Health Andrology, management of OAT, sperm DNA integrity, could be applied in addition to standard semen analysis, which is a description as we did, debated before. When many instances, but I want to stress the point that when standard IVF 
or ICSI is considered. Therefore, once again, to dichotomize your choice in terms of ART procedures. Therefore, just to briefly summarize, cons and pros. Pros, EFI is a key contributor for infertility or fertility, and mostly for unexplained infertility. It is relevant in recurrent pregnancy loss, both natural and the ART associated. The DFI can be associated in terms of decision making for ART and the kind of ART. And finally, DFI has a negative impact over offspring health. The cons part of the coin, why shouldn't be used and why such a huge amount of you know, doubt? Because it is costly. There is a, a, a huge amount of differences because of the different modalities to assess the FI. There is no cutoff value. Therefore, we, lo we lose. We still miss a, a threshold which could be widely and diffusely uh, 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 considered as the normal one. There is uh, a, a huge requirement for standardization among laboratories uh, since there is once again I inter-observer variability. And therefore, there is the, the need for, I would say, skilled observership uh, uh, and observers in order to promote uh, data which could be considered as much reliable as we can. Take on messages. I think that according to all the uh, guidelines of the uh, most important scientific societies dealing with this concept, there is no one single society which is against using this kind of assessment. It is important in some cases, thus including unexplained infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, for instance. And because we have several essays available, it is important to define, this is really important, what is the best among the others and the most relevant threshold should be defined. This is relevant for us to understand whether or not this kind of methodology could be applied in the everyday clinical practice. Thank you for, so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now we have the pleasure to listen to the lecture of uh, Professor Giverman. He's going to tell us his thoughts on the impact of antioxidant treatment on sperm DNA fragmentation index. Is there a treatment for sperm DNA integrity damage? Thank you very much, Nikolaos, and thank you very much to all your listening here on this. Um, evening, at least here in Europe. And um, I will say some few words about the treatment of DNA integrity damage. I uh, have, uh, I have uh, to declare conflict of interest, a potential conflict of interest. We have a strong collaboration in our part of Sweden and Eastern Denmark um, on reproductive issue. And we are receiving a grant from a pharmaceutical company uh, faring pharmaceutical, but it's uh, not related to any specific type of research. It's an unrestricted grant, and it is specifically not um, related to the topic which I am going to talk about. I mean, the first question is, of course, when you are talking about treating a condition like uh, high DNA fragmentation index, is uh, why should we do it? And I think that uh, Professor Salonia gave an, an, an excellent overview about uh, the potential impact of uh, sperm DNA damage on, uh, on the outcome of um, IVF and ICSI treatments. And he also touched a little bit about the health of the children. I will just add some few data to, to what uh, Professor Salonia has mentioned. And I will also <clears throat> add another factor this is also the question of the health of the female partner. On top of what um, uh, Andrea Salonia has told us about the impact of, of the DFI on, on the outcome of the treatment, and I think that the, uh, you mentioned, Andrea, that the, there are some studies showing that the, it's more IVF than ICSI treatment, and this is exactly our own experience. We are doing a lot of um, SCSA analysis in our lab in Sweden, 
and we see, do not see any effect of um, the high BFI on ICSI treatment. It, on the other hand, we have seen um, a, quite a uh, large effect on, on, the, um, on of the high DFI on the outcome of the standard IVF treatment. And we use the cutoff of DFI of 20%. And what we wanted to see, and what I'm showing this study is that, that, that the, in, in many studies you will read in, in the papers, you will see the, the outcome of one IVF treatment, the one ICSI treatment per couple. But as you know, these couples are treated several times. They're treated by several cycles and, and the treatment is changing. They can start with IVF treatment and then they can afterwards, if you have, for instance, poor fertilization, they change to ICSI treatment. So what we wanted to see is not only on the, on the result of one treatment, on the, but for the cumulative live birth rate after the couples receive all the treatments they are allowed to. In, in, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Scandinavian countries, we have a system that the, the, the public healthcare system is paying for three full treatments, which means up to three stimulated cycles, plus all the uh, frozen embryos, which can be like uh, uh, made during this cycle. So, so these figures are showing here. And if you just look, for instance, there are two different ways of um, calculating this cumulative life birth rate. It's there some two mathematical models, conservative and optimal one. But, but if you look at those um, full um, lines, uh, so this is comparison of the cumulative life birth rate for the, uh, for the treatments where you have DFI uh, below 20% is the blue one and above 20%, which is the red one. And this is for those treatment when you in the first cycle have IVF treatment. And you can see there's quite a big difference. It's about 5% difference in cumulative live birth rate. And this difference persists through all the cycles. So it means that at the end of the treatment, you will still have, if you have high DFI, and if you use IVF in the first treatment, that you will still have 5% difference in the cumulative live birth rate. And 5% in IVF business in the cumulative live birth rate is quite a lot. So, 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 so this high DFI has not only implication for like for the outcome of the single treatment, but for the whole treatment program which is offered to the to the couple. The other issue, I think, which is important and which uh, could be added to this, what you Andrea have said, is the health of the female partner. Because although the DFI is like a condition of the male, this is the female partner who is treated with the hormones. So this is extremely important also to limit the number of necessary treatment. And I think that treating like uh, high DFI, if we find a good treatment of this, can be a way how we can reduce the number of IVF and ICSI treatment and thereby also save uh, the female for unnecessary or excessive uh, hormone treatment. But what we found out when we have been looking now here and more than uh, uh, 2,500 couples who have been uh, treated by IVF and ICSI is that also the risk of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is, uh, as you know, a very serious uh, condition during the pregnancy. And there are like millions of women worldwide who are severely affected by this condition. The DFI does also influence the risk of preeclampsia in IVF treatment. So you can see if the couple has been treated by IVF, and if the DFI is more than 20%, that the odds ratio of the preeclampsia on in the in the female partner is three times higher than if the IVF was below 20%. I think that this is an important finding because it also like put the whole issue of uh, the importance of investigating and taking care of the male partner, not only just to improve his fertility, but also for the health of the female partner. It, 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 it brings this like as, as an important issue. And also what uh, Andrea was mentioning, of course, also for the health of the children, we know that the risk like for instance of congenital malformation is, uh, is higher in the IVF and ICSI cycles than in natural conception is about twice as high. And the question which we are asking, but we do not know yet, is it because some of these children are, uh, are 
are like born after conception with sperm with high BFI. I don't think that anybody, we have some experimental data on animals which could indicate this, but we don't have yet in the human data. We have now collected results from 2000 treatment and got some information about the health of the children. And we know the DFI of the father, but we are not fine, have not finalized the analysis. But I think that in, in very short time, we will have answer to this question. So I think that I hope that you, I have convinced you that, 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 that there is a big potential of treating of high DFI from different, different reasons. And if you look at this uh, cartoon here, which is uh, work by, made by Professor Aiton, which has also been mentioned, I think, by Andrea, who has been the one like a pioneer in the whole issue of, of reactive oxygen species and uh, the aspect of uh, DNA fragmentation index in spermatozoa. He has a proposed a two-step model when the first step is like a, a damage to the spermatozoa, which is uh, due to disorder of sperm spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis, which can have several causes. And these disorders make the sperm more sensitive to the oxidative attack. And then in the next stage, um, the, 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 the <clears throat> sperms get attacked by the reactive oxygen species. And this um, is a cause of the uh, DNA fragmentation in the spermatozoa. So from, from a theoretical point of view, by using antioxidants, it should be possible to limit the second step, to, to block the second step, and thereby treat those men who have high DFI. So, I mean, from like a biological point of view, it sounds like a, like a great idea, and people have tried this. And I can show results of some study. Unfortunately, the results have not been that encouraging. We have by ourselves made a study here where we have, uh, I think, investigated 30, 77 men with high DFI and then we randomized to two groups, uh, an antioxidant group. They have received antioxidant treatment for six months. And there was also a placebo group. The, the conclusion was that there was uh, no difference in, in DFI between the placebo group and the control group uh, and, and the antioxidant group uh, after three months or neither after six months of treatment. And then uh, I think the most recent study which came on this issue was another uh, randomized study which included 44 patients treated for three months with antioxidants and three, or three months with placebo. And they came to exactly the same conclusion. There was no effect of antioxidant treatment. But on the other hand, there are, some other studies, like this one here from 2030, which could um, show um, uh, uh, using another technique for measuring uh, DFI, it was channel. In the first two studies I mentioned, it was CSA assay. They could show a significant improvement in sperm DFI after treating with antioxidants. As you can see here, it was a, 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 a great uh, difference but not with uh, placebo, there was no difference. And there's also some Cochrane analysis, which could indicate not, they were not specifically looking at the DFI, but they were looking at the like uh, live birth rates for couples attending fertility clinics. And they found that there was uh, weak, but some evidence that antioxidant treatment uh, uh, can be uh, efficient in uh, those patients. So. Uh, we don't know yet for sure. I think that this is a field which is very open for more research. And the issue is also that people in different studies are not only using different tests for assessment of the sperm DNA fragmentation, but they are also using different mixture of antioxidants. And we don't know for sure which one of those mixtures is best or maybe <clears throat> different males needs different types of um, antioxidants. So there's a lot of open questions, but there might also be <clears throat> And other options of treating high DFI, uh, not only the antioxidants, but they are also coming some studies uh, on the, the use of FSH. The FSH, which you know, uh, uh, the role in spermatogenesis. And uh, this is like um, from a, a meta-analysis, which has shown that uh, you can improve the DFI <clears throat> by FSH treatment. So it could be another alternative to using the antioxidants to use the um, FSA treatment. So I think that 
that, that I, I feel personally that treating men with high DNA fragmentation index is maybe one of the lowest hanging fruits in the field of andrology when it comes to treating males with fertility problems. We have some biological understanding of the mechanism which is behind the high DFI. We have some options for treatment. We have to do more studies and we have to design them in maybe in a better way. But I think that this is something which, uh, which uh, can be done. And I think that this has had great implications and like um, really we put the, the andrology on, 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 on the map when it comes to, to treatment of infertility, not only for the sake of the infertility infertile couples and the question of getting children, but also for the health of the females and health of the children. The results of, of treatment with antioxidants have been, for some of them, slightly disappointed. But uh, I think that when we are talking about the precision medicine, which we are also talking about in, in, in other fields of medicine, that we have to consider that we should use the right antioxidant to the right patients, and also consider, in some cases, other options like the FSH, which I mentioned before. Thank you very much. Today, we are going to discuss whether testicular spermatozoa or ejaculated spermatozoa should be preferred for the performance of fixie techniques for the treatment of men with severe oligoasthenoteratospermia. I don't have to declare something, any interest. The test is, is the lake and the semen with the seminal plasma is the river. And several recent studies allow us to hypothesize that there is a degree of oxidative stress during the post-testicular sperm passage. And an attractive question really is, whether the main sperm DNA oxidation or oxidative stress in the male reproductive tract occurs when the spermatozoa are within the testes or when the spermatozoa pass through the epididymal lumen or even in the human when the spermatozoa pass through the lumen of the human vas deferens. So it appears the answer is that sperm DNA damage in ejaculated samples begin after spermatozoa are released from the Sertoli cells and spermatozoa recovered from the testes show less damage than ejaculated spermatozoa. Greg and co-workers reported higher pregnancy rates with FIXI using testicular rather than ejaculated spermatozoa in couples with high levels of sperm DNA damage. It was proposed that the lower outcome with ejaculated spermatozoa was a result of acquired sperm DNA damage during spermatozoal transit through the epididymis. However, why, why the sperm DNA damage occurs during the epididymal passage? Because it relates to the susceptibility of sperm chromatin to oxidative attack, particularly during epididymis transit. And in fact, it has been proven that the higher the degree of damage in sperm DNA integrity, the lower the life birth rate in experimental animal populations. Significant and negative correlations 
were observed between oxidative stress markers and the number of alive offspring in mating studies when the male gametes were collected from the epididymal lumen from rats with chronic renal failure that is known to adversely affect the DNA integrity in spermatozoa in the epididymis of the animals. And in the same fashion, significant and negative correlations were observed between oxidative stress markers and number of alive offspring from spermatozoa selected, recovered from the epididymal lumen of animals with chronic renal failure and processed for rat ICSI techniques. So the conclusion of these studies in experimental animals is that sperm DNA damage affects the live birth rate. In the mouse model with abnormal sperm chromatin, decline in fertility of mouse sperm with abnormal chromatin during epididymal passage was revealed. The results of this study by the group of Hawaii have demonstrated that in mice with sperm chromatin abnormalities, the decline in fertility in spermatozoa with ICSI occurs after the passage through the head of epididymis. And the passage of sperm through the epididymis is associated with a loss of sperm DNA integrity and also a loss in fertilizing capacity. Paroxetine is known that affects ejaculation and can adversely affect sperm DNA integrity in a fast interval, actually within weeks. The short length of the time that it is necessary to observe sperm DNA damage after paroxetine administration allow us to hypothesize that the mechanism of sperm DNA damage is acquired after testicular sperm production and after sperm entrance in the head of epididymis. There are advantages of using ejaculated spermatozoa in severe oligoastenoteratospermic men. Testicular surgery is avoided. Complications of testicular surgery are avoided. However, there are disadvantages when laboratories use ejaculated spermatozoa for assistant reproductive technology for the treatment of men with OAT syndrome. Preparation of such ejaculated samples requires prolonged preparation. And high reactive oxygen species generation during centrifugation affects the plasma membrane of the male gamete. The result is low sperm motility, low viability, and low ICSI outcome. And all of the physicians who are engaged in laboratory techniques they know that there are difficulties in freezing spermatozoa of very low concentration, such as the sperm concentration in a semen sample of a man with severe oligoastenoteratospermia. Additionally, it might be emphasized that long period of sperm transit through the epididymis and the male reproductive tract 
results in a large sperm nuclear DNA damage. And the result is lower ICSI outcome. This hypothesis is vividly supported by topographic DNA fragmentation IDEX mapping performed at discrete locations along the male reproductive tract and a probable ovarian stimulation may be needless if in the semen the number of spermatozoa and the quality of spermatozoa that are recovered by the responsible embryology are of low viability or of low quality. A very interesting systematic review and meta-analysis have been published concerning the reproduction outcome of testicular versus ejaculated sperm for ICSI among men with high levels of DNA fragmentation in the semen. This meta-analysis demonstrated that testicular sperm have lower levels of sperm DNA fragmentation compared with ejaculated spermatozoa. And in fact, TSAX for men with high post-testicular sperm DNA fragmentation index improves the reproductive outcomes concerned compared, compared with the outcome of fixy techniques using ejaculated spermatozoa. TSAX, according to the authors of this study, should be reserved for men with substantial sperm DNA integrity damage undergoing ART techniques, particularly those subpopulations who are experiencing one repeated ICSI failures and second, when measures to correct underlying factors causing damage in sperm DNA integrity have failed. For example, a man with varicocele and high damage in sperm DNA integrity should be processed for varicoselectomy. And varicoselectomy may ameliorate the damage in sperm DNA integrity. Another study was interesting because that study evaluated the role of testicular sperm extraction for the treatment of normozoospermic men with high sperm DNA fragmentation index. And when high DFI was detected, ICSI using testicular spermatozoa obtained by TESA or TESA seems to be an effective option, particularly for those with repeated ART failures in terms of clinical pregnancies, even though conventional sperm parameters are normal. The blue arrow demonstrates the effect of DNA damage in spermatozoa on embryonic quality. The number and the size of blastomeres are not equal with that observed in normal embryos. Unequal blastomere size. This is a low embryonic quality, probably due to the fact of high degree of sperm DNA damage in the spermatozoa that were used for assisted reproduction. In the human, the red arrows indicate in a human blastocyst a very narrow orifice in the zona pellucida that does not allow the embryo to go out outside the zona pellucida in the uterine cavity. This may cause malformation in the blastocyst and the overall result may be low life birth rate due to the sperm DNA fragmentation, high values uh, 
of, the, of this IDEX. The guidelines of European Academy of Hydrology in cases of two or more ejaculated spermatozoa ICSI failures with uncorrectable high DFI, TESE and use of testicular sperm for ICSI can be considered. However, this statement of EAA is characterized by low quality evidence. And let's go to our family. Let's go to the European Association of Urology. The guideline committee for reproductive and sexual health chaired by our colleagues, Professor Salonia and Minhas, state that urologists may offer the use of testicular sperm in patients with high DFI, patients with unexplained infertility. However, common causes of oxidative stress should have been excluded. Patients with failure in previous assistant reproductive technology trials. Patients who have been counseled regarding the low level of evidence for this. And the patients should weigh up in a schedule, in a scale, the risk of performing an invasive procedure in a potentially normosospermic or unexplained condition. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask Professor Minhas from London to share with us his thoughts on which is the best sperm retrieval technique for men with non-obstructive azospermic. Thank you. So this is a very difficult task. Which best is the best sperm retrieval technique for men with non-obstructive azospermia? And I think this is a very difficult question to answer, which I will try to do uh, in a very limited uh, time frame. So first of all, I think it's important, obviously, if you're going to optimize sperm extraction in these patients to consider those patients who have adequately been investigated. Certainly, as we know, genetic valuation of the infertility patient should be undertaken. In particular, the issue surrounding the role of FSH, LH, and the role of these indexes in terms of determining sperm extraction, of course, remain controversial. But of course, in the workup of the patients, they would have LH, FSH, testosterone. We haven't got time to talk about varicocils or low testosterone and the role of empiric stimulation in this group. But the other issue, of course, is surrounding why micro why deletions, of course, if you have a Y deletion, then, of course, you may be offset with an AZFA or B deletion where you wouldn't find sperm in these cases. So it's obviously important to tee the patient up for surgery. Again, as I'll allude to in a second, the role of various treatments in terms of stimulating sperm action, FSH and LH, uh, and their role in terms of gonadotrophins, we already know. But of course, the size of testis may also be important and in terms of counseling patients as well in terms of sperm extraction. Again, just to remind you that LH and FSH are, are raised, usually in the condition of non-obstructive azospermia, but of course there are conditions where um, in non-obstructive azospermia where FSH and LH uh, can be normal, particularly in the subset of patients with maturation arrest. So we know obviously spermatogenesis is dependent upon LH and FSH levels. In turn, usually the testes is small in patients with non-obstructive azospermia, and the group of patients we're mainly going to focus on, of course, are those patients that have um, non-obstructive azospermia who have hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. We must remember, of course, that when choosing patients for surgery, there are a number of conditions, including genetic abnormalities like Klinefelter's, where sperm retrieval rates do vary in the literature as well. But of course, we must remember that choosing patients who may be post chemotherapy, chemotherapy who have had gonadotropic toxic treatments, also is important in terms of timing sperm retrieval, which may, of course, affect your chances of finding sperm. 
So if we look back in terms of the introduction of sperm extraction, what's happened over time, you can see that generally speaking, uh, sperm was used first used for ICSI in 1992. Subsequent to that, the first use of testicular sperm was in 1993. And then following this in 1995, testicular sperm was used in men with non-obstructive age of spermia for IVF ICSI. It was in 1998, of course, that the first description of MTZ was made uh, by Schlegel. And subsequent to that has now been developed, as we know, across the world. The question we're really asking is, what is the best sperm retrieval technique? And if you look at the sperm retrieval techniques that are currently available for non-obstructive aspermia. These would consist of testicular sperm aspiration, or so-called teaser. We know, of course, historically from studies, the sperm retrieval rates are low in men with non-obstructive aspermia. The alternative, of course, is this technique of the conventional testicular sperm extraction, if we use that term, which is making multiple biopsies on the testis. Of course, this can be difficult, particularly in a very small testis, making multiple biopsies. And of course, the question, of course, is in terms of standardization of what people are doing in terms of surgeons, in terms of this technique, of course, remains to be seen because some people would form two, three, and as you can see here, it was five biopsies. Therefore, it's very difficult, of course, in standardization of all these techniques. But perhaps the technique that most of us are used to is that of the micro TZ, uh, which is shown in the bottom picture there. And of course, this has been published extensively within the literature. But what we must remember, of course, is data in terms of trial data, in terms of randomized studies of CTZ versus MTZ, as we'll call them for now, is limited. So this is your typical MTZ, you're all used to this, this is bivalvin of the testis and finding dilated opaque tubules and the concept of course appears to be that of an ideal concept in terms of surgery, in trying to minimise complications and risk but as we'll see studies we'll see some of the data that's available here. So again, which is the best technique? So if you look at the historical data that we have, you can see here's a public publication European Urology showing that overall, if you looked at MTZ, compare this in a number of studies, compared to the surgical sperm retrieval rate in terms of testicular sperm extraction, in terms of conventional TZ, overall, these were the kind of figures that you would see in terms of advantages, roughly 40 to 60% sperm extraction rates in MTZ. And these are the kind of figures that you seem to see in terms of their ability or superiority over conventional TZ. Again, this is highlight conventional TZ versus MTZ. These are some of these historical studies that we see here. And as you can see overall, and remember non-randomized studies, you can see that MTZ appears to be superior to conventional TZ. So this was a meta-analysis. This was published by Peter Schlegel and his group, comparison of micro TZ versus testicular sperm extraction. Um, and conventional TZ, because this is the two groups we're really talking about. Because if we look at the groups, for example, who have teaser, although there may be isolated publications that indicate the sperm retrieval rates can be in there 30%, overall, we know that these two techniques are likely to be superior to teaser in non-obstructive age of sperm. However, this analysis here, and these are the, the forest pots you can see here and the comparison of CTZ versus MTZ and also CTZ versus TZ. And what they found consistently was that micro TZ was 1.5 times more likely in successful sperm extraction compared to CTZ. And similarly, performance of CTZ was twice more likely to yield sperm compared to TZ. Of course, you would say that's very simple. It's great meta-analysis. But then we've got to delve a little bit deeper into some of these studies and the studies that we have and in terms of whether or not the level of evidence that we have. And of course, that's the problem. So we did a, a meta-analysis, Giovanni Corona and the EAU um, or ESAL group. And we found uh, that in this meta-analysis, we actually found no difference between CTZ and MTZ. And I'll come to that in one second. But we looked at this sperm recovery in ICSI outcomes in this meta-analysis that we published. And you can see this in the overall uh, CTZ sperm extraction rates compared to the overall MTZ rates here as well. So you see overall there was no difference. And in fact, this included 117 studies, uh, as you see in the Prisma flow chart, which we included in this study. What we overall found was that the positive surgical sperm retrieval rate 
was found in almost 50% of cases independent of the surgical approach used. Testicular volume in this particular study, although I grant you other studies, meta-analyses have shown no uh, value of predictive factors such as volume and FSH levels. But in this study, we found that testicular volume was the only parameter who could predict surgical sleeper rates. Interestingly, the rates of hematoma testicular fibrosis um, were no different and decreased in serum testosterone between the two groups. And of course, this of course is in complete stark contrast to previous studies. So if we look at why and we try and analyze and dig a little bit deeper as to why this could be, I think we need to analyze a little bit more in terms of reporting outcomes from these studies and what are we exactly reporting? So for example, if you look at a testicular sperm that you may get from a testicular sperm extraction, if it's an abnormal sperm and it's not going to be useful for ICSI treatment, would you consider that as a positive sperm retrieval rate? And the answer is, is in the answer is no, but of course, in studies, of course, we don't know what people are predicting, as I'll show you from some of the studies that we have. If you look at terms of patient age or a number of clinical factors, and if you look at studies in terms of comparative data, it's very difficult to draw conclusions because the patient age groups vary considerably. The smoking history, obesity, BMI, testicular volume, all those have been shown in this meta-analysis to be uh, predictive. There are other studies which have shown no value, including my own study showing no value of testicular volume in predicting outcome. History of cryptorganism and other historical factors which aren't really taken into account in many of these studies. Likewise, if you look at um, composite markers as well, for example, of FSH and F, do not have any role according to many of the studies in terms of their um, predictive value in retrieving. But again, this varies from study to study. The values do vary. Many of these studies don't include, as we'll see, these values as well. So therefore, making direct comparisons between the two techniques is very difficult. Of course, there are embryological factors as well, as I already alluded to. What is a successful sperm extraction? How do you define a successful sperm extraction? Is that a sperm extraction that has found a sperm that is usable for ICSI, or is that a sperm extraction that's found this so-called abnormal sperm that isn't going to be of any use in terms of assisted reproductive technology? We must also remember surgical factors. So if somebody has performed 10 MTZs, are they inferior in their sperm retrieval rates to those compared 50? And in fact, this study here, um, which was published by Ishikawa, compared the surgical sperm retrieval rates and operator times were shorter as the, um, as the surgeon became more experienced. And certainly if you increase the surgical sperm retrieval uh, rates in terms of the number of procedures performed above 50, then the rates did increase. So therefore, we also need to take into account surgical factors and we'll come to the other factors in one second. So therefore, we've got to look at this and, and say that actually the data we're actually dealing with, is it meaningful? So therefore, we may be doing or performing meta-analysis, but actually the comparative data that we're performing, is it actually viable to compare like with like? And the answer is, is probably no. So there are many preoperative factors if you look at the studies. And I would recommend you read this paper, which was published in Andology recently, Evaluating the quality of reported outcomes from microsurgical NOA analysis. And what you find in this is many of the patients therefore targeted in terms of the sperm retrieval rates. They may or may not have had genetic testing. The different groups vary. Some of these include patients with purely Klein filters or excluded genetic uh, abnormalities as well. But there are many other factors as well as we've already alluded to, interoperative factors, time taken for surgery, in terms of the type of anesthesia use. I've seen patients, I can tell you, who've had so-called MTs performed under local anesthetic, which of course is for discussion. Was there an embryologist in theatre? How is um, tissue processed? And therefore that leads on to the fact that are your sperm retrieval rates really standardised and reflective uh, of practice throughout? And of course, what about the sperm? What about did you use fresh or frozen sperm? And ultimately, should we not be looking at clinical outcomes of fertilization rates and live birth rates often not reported in these studies? And these are some of the studies, of course, that have been published, which there are many, many, but just to give you a flavor of some of these as well. 
Again, in this study, what they found was that if you looked at some of these studies and they picked out 55 such studies, in 52 of these studies, the surgical details were apparent, and therefore the type of technique described, and you would have thought there should be standardization of this technique. Was there simultaneous presence of an embryologist? And the embryologist is integral to surgical identification of sperm and in fact may minimize the time taken to for the procedure and also at the same time may allow you to only do one test. So, and it's really interesting that only 31% of the articles reported on whether an embryologist was present. In terms of tissue processing, um, only 51% of the studies look, looked at tissue processing. Of course, the justification to the end of surgery, what is the justification that we use? One sperm, six sperm, 12 sperm, and therefore we could go on. And the sperm retrieval rate, of course, is always published. But of course, we then go into that difficult area of what is exactly a surgical sperm retrieval rate as well as but also in terms of care of the sperm is not documented either. And even fewer works document this as well. Interestingly, post-surgical adverse events are only described as well in 35% of patients. So there are many inconsistencies in the reporting of outcome from microsurgical sperm extraction. And I think we need to take this into account when we decide which is the best technique. One of the, one of the options is, of course, is to report longitudinal live birth rates, which we did in this study here, which we published in 2018. And in fact, what we argued was what are the, if you have a patient who has aegospermia, non-obstructive aegospermia, what are their chances of a live birth when you first see them in clinic? How could you count them? And that figure is 15%. But if you are able to freeze more sperm in terms of number of vials and the cumulative success rates in terms of after five cycles and the expected uh, delivery rates increase significantly. But these are perhaps kind of figures that we should be using in order to compare our studies as well. And this just highlights that there. And if you look at studies that are reports on live birth rates following MTZ or TZ, they are very scant in the literature. And of course, many of these studies um, in terms of live birth rate outcomes will depend upon the female partner's age, as we've already seen in terms of their ovarian reserve, but also on the various techniques of the embryologist, which are crucial to outcomes. What about fine needle mapping? I mean, this is, of course, a very difficult control and I'll highlight the end of this, but the argument being that fine needle mapping, and I talk about the concept of FNA map-directed testicular sperm extraction, and in this context, popularised by um, Turek in Los Angeles, would argue the needle into the test diagnostic cytological gain where you can then the problem here, of course, is do we believe in this procedure? It's been well described, as you can see here, with the aspiration being performed and cytological samples being taken. And if you look at the results, there, is, there are good results in terms of outcome and in terms of the predictive value of finding sperm subsequently. I think the problem here, of course, where we need is direct comparisons of outcomes. And again, what we do is we compare retrospective series versus microtesy in the context of patients having had microtesy and then going further to have this procedure and finding sperm in about 20%. But what do we define as sperm, whether they were usable sperm for ICSI treatment? Just highlighting once again, the other problem, of course, with the mapping technique and our opinion from the EAU guidelines, of course, is you then need a secondary procedure to find sperm. Speaking on a personal level, having been on, in on patients who had simple teaser before, you can sometimes get quite marked sclerosis or scarring of the testis when you perform a redo TZ. And so therefore, putting 20 needles into a testicle, of course, may of course result in significant sclerosis. And I think this is the kind of data that we need to tease and extract. So if you look at the EAU guidelines, what have we said about some of these controversial, difficult areas? Well, the answer is, to summarise, that fine needle aspiration in terms of the context, we believe, but as well as teasing, line to This is particularly in the context of a prognostic procedure prior to definitive surgical sperm extraction as a second with 
upon the data we have, and microtesia are techniques of choice for retrieving sperm in patients with NOA, we cannot say that MTZ is superior, although, of course, many of us will use this technique above CTZ. There are no pre chemical variables that may be considered sufficient to be reliable predictors of positive sperm retrieval rates in men with NOA. The use of medical therapy, I'm not dealing with this, but of course you can read the guidance. So how can I answer your question? I think the answer to the question is, is which technique is best? I think we need well-designed randomized control studies, which are sufficiently powered uh, to determine whether MTZ is superior to CTZ in men with NOA. Thank you for your time. I would like to thank very much Professor Minhas for his innovative uh, lecture. And uh, let's see some interesting questions. And actually, uh, I have picked up a question, which is the SRR sperm recovery rate performing either micro tesse or tesse in men with atrophic testes secondary to mom's pathophysiology? Sux, can you give us your thoughts? Sorry, the question, the question is, is what is what is the best technique or in, in atrophic testes? Atrophic testes and uh, we anticipate better SRR compared with other subpopulations of men with yeah. non-obstructive azospermia. Thank you. Sure. I think the, I think with patients with mumps, of course, we're talking about post pubertal mumps, the it if you look, go into a test on a patient who has had post-pubertal mumps, you will find marked sclerosis. Um, I think my own experience of post-pubertal mumps and sperm retrieval, uh, particularly after some time, over a year, is that often you do not find sperm and there's quite marked sclerosis. So even if you're doing a micro TZ in that group of patients, then I think the sperm retrieval rates are going to be exceedingly low. I think for atrophic testes, I find that using a micro TZ is superior purely from the perspective of ease of surgery. And it's much easier to bivalve the testis and much easier to perform the surgery under the microscope. Often I will operate under a microscope on redo procedures, particularly when there's fusion of the layers and particularly when there's significant scarring. So from that perspective, certainly on the redo procedures, the small testis, I think the surgical technique is superior. Thank you, Sox, and please allow me to direct to you uh, the next question, which is very important for our younger colleagues who participate and listen to our discussion. Which is more harmful for the testes, TESE or micro TESE? And please allow me to ask also FNA. So very, it's a very good question. And again, the data is very limited. And this is where we need studies. This is where I implore people to actually do studies. So I have seen a lot of people argue that if you put a needle aspiration in and you pull the needle aspiration, the risk of damage is very small. But we've all been there. I did a micro TZ yesterday, which was very vascular. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was even using an open procedure. I was able to diathomize and stop the bleeding. But then I imagined doing a blind biopsy, for example, or even tether would be very limited in terms of your operative visibility. And therefore, the risk of hematoma, I think, personally would be higher. I have to say, I've seen many patients who've had complete whiteout sclerosis of their testis on redo surgery, having previously had tether for even cryptogespermia. So I would worry considerably about that. So on a personal level, I cannot give you the data. I think the MTZ is superior in that context. Thank you, Sox, and I would like to direct a question to Professor Giverman. Alexander, uh, you gave us today a direction, a thought, that we may have pharmaceutical agents to treat damage in DNA integrity. There are no many chapters in books with the title, How to Treat DNA damage in DNA, DNA integrity. So our colleagues ask you, which type, what type of antioxidants would you recommend 
for males with asthenospermia, which should be the duration of antioxidants. And as a good friend of you, please allow me to add an element. Would you routinely perform evaluation quantitatively of the reactive oxygen species using the method of Eva Lamirade and Claude Gannon to assess the quantitatively the reactive oxygen species content before you go to administer antioxidants? Please, Alexander. I, I um, will try to make very short. We are not using routine antioxidants. And the reason is because we do not feel that the level of evidence is sufficient now to say that one or another oxidant is better than the other one. And, and as I show also the results, they are conflicting and, 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 and most of the study do not show. But, but I, I think that this is an extremely important area of research. And as I mentioned before, I, I think this is really a low hanging fruit within the area of andrology. And I, I am sure that there are some groups of men with uh, high DNA fragmentation index which can be held by this treatment. So um, how long time, for the same reason I cannot say, most people use three or six months, but it is based on this traditional way of thinking in andrology. It's some, because of the duration of spermatogenesis, about two months, so people say, okay, let's have for one and a half cycles or two cycles or three cycles, but we don't have enough evidence to say anything. So. Um, a lot of research, but I think that for clinical routine use, we are not there yet. And we are not using um, oxidative stress measurements, but we are using routinely SCSA test on all our patients. Thank you very much, Alexander. We have one question from Greece, from a very young and very intelligent anthropologist. Uh, it concerns my talk, but I would like to listen to the opinion of the chair of the EAU Guidelines Committee for uh, Reproductive and Sexual Health, Andrea. Uh, Greek andrologists ask you, uh, which is the best indication in men for severe oligozoasthenospermia to go straight forward and to advise TESE and not collection of semen, centrifugation, isolation of the pellet. Andrea, please. Nicolaus, I'm so sorry. I completely missed your question. I was completely off. I don't know why. Andrea, sorry. we need your knowledge. We need your intelligence. Yeah. You are the chair of the guideline office on the, for uh, reproductive sexual health. Which is the best indication in a man with a severe oligoastheno teratozoospermia to go straight forward to use testicular sperm and neglect the ejaculated spermatozoa? Uh, if I may, from the very practical standpoint, and uh, if I may uh, associate my, you know, uh, talk to this specific and compelling question, I would say the higher the value of the FI, the best, the, the better to use uh, uh, ICSI-TZ, which means uh, uh, intratesticular sperm. But as uh, Alexander has just said, concerning the use of any type of antioxidant and uh, SACS uh, does perfectly know we are in, uh, you know, debating uh, the uh, use of uh, any kind of uh, intratesticular sperm versus uh, the ejaculated one in men uh, without uh, azospermia. Probably the answer could be the higher value of DFI could, you know, indicate the use of this kind of uh, 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 um, surgery as compared to using the ejaculate one. But still, uh, data are not that strong to say this is the last answer, the best answer from my standpoint. Data are not strong enough. Uh, Saxa has done, along with his own uh, uh, fellows, an impressive uh, 
amount of uh, evaluation concerning the fact that, unfortunately speaking, there is a huge, between brackets, market of performing uh, this kind of surgery, even without any reason for. And uh, I think that up to now, in men who uh, belong to couples, or I would say infertile couple with uh, recurrent miscarriages and recurrent pregnancy loss uh, with or without uh, ART, that could be the option for, but still data are not conclusive and therefore controversies are still there. That's my personal uh, point of view. Thank you very much, Andrea. Alexander, uh, some colleagues, two colleagues have a similar question. Okay, your papers, the paper of our colleagues in this panel support straightforward or indirectly the utilization of antioxidants for the alleviation of male infertility uh, when the sperm DFI index is relatively high. And you know very well, you are aware of uh, the role of uh, reactive oxygen species for the tyrosine kilase for pho phosphorylation you know that ROS are important for sperm capacitation. So are there any detrimental effects of antioxidants in high doses? How you will have, how you will recommend the balance of high and low doses of antioxidants? I, uh, Andrea, you indicated that you have a good answer to this question because I, I, I am not sure that I can give it a good answer to this. I, I, I am not aware that anybody have like made some uh, systematic studies on the dose of antioxidants. Most of these antioxidants are a mixture of five, 10 different compounds and they are completely different from, from each other. So I, 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 I am not sure that I, can, that I can recommend one for another. <laughs> If I may add something, I completely agree with Alexander. We do not have data enough to say that this kind of compound is better than the other one. And most of the data are dealing with uh, mixed types of uh, compounds. And this is the case for us not having any real randomized controlled trial, any real prospective uh, data, which may be useful in the everyday clinical practice. This is the case. At the same time, most of the data, uh, we are pro using uh, the FI, even in the setting of uh, antioxidant treatment. This is uh, uh, crystal clear. At the same time, if you try to read uh, uh, between lines, uh, the four recommend, no, I would say the four guidelines, EAU, AUA, uh, ESHRAE, EAA, they are telling us the very same uh, thing, which means, uh, you may use this kind of assessment in some context, without including unexplained whatsoever. They do not say use, or please try and start using the antioxidants on the everyday clinical practice, uh, broadly speaking. This is very important. And Alexander is more than uh, uh, right in telling you there is no one single answer since we do not have uh, dosages, uh, we do not have uh, uh, the, the best uh, uh, compound to be used. And unfortunately, at least in my country, the reality is that we do have uh, many compounds. Uh, they are mixing a lot of different molecules. Uh, and therefore, we, we cannot say this is better than the other one. That's my personal feeling. And the recommendations uh, will uh, you know, uh, mirror this kind of uh, feeling. Thank you very much, Andrea. On behalf of the European section of Andrological Urology of the European Association of Urology, I would like to thank very much all of the participants in this webinar. Uh, the creative discussion with our three experts, Professor Giverman, Professor Minhas, Professor Salonia, and of course, to thank very much the European School of Urology, the EAU section office, the EAU guidelines committee, 
for giving to us, to the SAO board members, the opportunity to interact with our colleagues worldwide. Thank you very much.